My name is Warren Furman, also known as Ace from the Gladiators. Urgh! You remember now, don't you? So the Gladiator show was the first reality TV show in that the general members of the public, fit members of the public, you know, firemen, nurses, these things, could write into the show and then they could pit, pit their wits against the mighty gladiators, eight men, eight women, super fit. You'd have to fight them in obscure games. If you've been to a wacky warehouse for kids, it was like that really for adults. But the great thing for the contestants is not only would they get their five minutes of fame, if they got through to the final, they could win cars, Jeeps, holidays, thousands and thousands of pounds. So it was a game show with a difference. Everybody wanted to be on it, it seemed, and it was staple Saturday night television. You had Blind Date, then you had Gladiators, and it's really, uh, it's really got its place locked in history. I find there's a lot of nostalgia for it now as well. Lots of people are like, wow, this was, it reminds me of my Saturday nights with my mum and my dad sat down, and so I think it has a real magical place in people's hearts as well. Once I got the part on the show, I think one of the most difficult parts was actually choosing a name because they gave you freedom with that. You know, you can choose your gladiator name, but be very careful because whatever you choose, uh, you would be stuck with for the rest of your life. And uh, some of the other gladiators gave me tips. They were like, well, now that you are a TV star, you're not a VIP, a very important person. You're more than that. You're a CIP. You're a commercially important person. So don't sell out with your name. I knew it was called show business, but I was completely unaware it was a business. I just thought you get rich and famous and you live happily ever after. I had no idea I'm now in this machine and there's this you know, commercial agenda behind it all. So I'm like, well, how do you choose a name? Very difficult, very difficult. And they were coming up with names like, what do you think about Rebel or some strange names. And I was like, no, oh, I couldn't imagine being called that. But I had a cousin called Acer. So when they said Ace, I thought, well, that sounds sort of normal, but in, in gladiator terms, it sounds rubbish. Because if you think, you'd have, you'd have John Fashion who say, next up we've got Mark, and he'll be facing the mighty Rhino, or he'll be facing the massive warrior. And then I thought, next up we've got Mark, and he'll be facing Ace. Just sounded rubbish. And I was like, nah, not Ace. And I remember Ken Warwick saying to me, well, we think Ace is really good, you know. And they were trying to sell it to me, and I didn't understand why at the time. But they're like, well, you know, it means like leader of the pack. The Ace, nothing trumps the Ace. What do you think? I was like, no, I really don't, don't like the name Ace. And so I was, I was toying with this. And then um, Ken Warwick said to me, uh, McVitie's, the biscuit manufacturers, are bringing out a new biscuit. And I'm like, right. And they said, he said, then they're calling it the Ace. And I was like, right. And he said, and it comes with 20,000 pounds worth of advertising revenue, which would be yours if you had the name Ace. I said, I love the name Ace. I love it. Let's go with that, shall we? So my um, parents were EastEnders and uh, uh, they lived in Harlow for a while, Harlow Newtown, but there was a recession on. So mum and dad decided to up sticks and move to Doncaster. That's where I was born. So I'm a Yorkshireman at heart actually. Um, but unfortunately for dad, there was another recession on uh, once we was in Doncaster. So it was actually quite tough growing up in a working class environment. Um, I had four brothers, so you know, five of us. Mum and dad, mum not working, you know, trying to be the housewife, very difficult, trying to look after all boys as well. Uh, my dad was the most hardworking person that I've ever met. Um, he had a great work ethic, you know, and uh, he used to have some sayings like, dirty hands means clean money. Um, he'd say, skills pay the bills. Uh, and, he'd, and he'd say, you will all be roofers. And I used to think, this is slave labor. He's just, he's just trying to steal us to be his free laborers. <laughs> And, and I think what didn't help me is going to work with dad. I found it really difficult. I was a very skinny kid. I didn't, you know, my physical attributes didn't, didn't work well. Trying to climb a ladder with, with tiles on my shoulder and stuff. I fell through the roof. It was always freezing cold, always raining in this country. Roofing's the third most dangerous job you can do. Um, you know, and here's dad saying to me, you know, the secret to a happy life is you work hard and you play hard, these sorts of things. And I'm thinking, but that's not what I'm seeing in our family. You know, it only takes a bit of rain or for the car to break down and we're skin and you and mum are rowing. 
And so I just thought I'd rather do any job in the world than be a roofer. This was the problem, I think. You know, we had a brother that died and when our brother died, mum and dad just said, there's no God, period. If there was a God, your baby brother wouldn't have died. That made complete sense to me. Uh, but from that, I deduced, well, okay, you get one life. And if I look at the statistics, nobody lasts forever. And I thought, well, I want to live rich and I want to have everything that I want. And I don't want to be clambering around on a roof, coming home at the end of the day, covered in filth. I thought I'd rather do anything but roofing, but I grew up in a celebrity culture. The big stars at the time, uh, I remember it was Sylvester Stallone as Rambo, you know, taking on the world on his own, very anti-authority, I'm not going to do the norm, you know. I've been oppressed and I'm going to get my own back. And then there was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, and all the films he was in, and it's just, I looked at their personal lives, you know, and they were just had these incredible lives. Arnold Schwarzenegger was the most highest paid movie star in history, in history. Getting these millions and millions of pounds and driving around these supercars and then, you know, he had his own private jet, you know, and I was like, if you get one life, that's how you want to live, surely. And, and so I studied him and I used to think, well, he's been to the gym and he's built up big muscles. But when I'm looking at his acting ability, I don't think he's been to any uh, acting schools. He's like, I'll be back. I was like, I reckon I could do that. So if I go and I lift up these weights and I get like this, that's what I'll do. And so I shared this with my dad. You know, he's like, what are you going to do when you leave school, son? Because you're not coming to work with me. This is all a dream. He said, they have their lives, these people with money. We are in a class that's completely different. So get this stupid nonsense out your head. Because if you don't, you'll be out, you'll have nowhere to live. It's anything that consumes sun without producing. You think about it, it makes perfect sense. Any, if you look to nature, anything that consumes without producing fails. You know, you have to produce something, otherwise you're just leeching. It's like weeds, isn't it? It takes all the nutrients, but no fruit. And so that made sense. So when he's coming home from work and all my brothers are working hard and then he's seeing me and I'm drinking all the milk out of the fridge, I'm eating all the tuna, I'm eating 10 chicken breasts. He's like, you've got to be kidding me, yeah? All your brothers are working, you're eating us out of the house and home. Get out. And uh, so he kicked me out and I moved into the YWCA. So if he was homeless in Harlow at that time, you moved into the Young Women's Christian Association. There are worse places for a teenage lad to live. A little bit embarrassing, but the reason I was in the YWCA is simply because there was no YMCA. The Christian bit meant nothing to me. I just thought, well, it's somewhere to live, so, so off I go. And that's, where, and that's where I moved. I think I was about 18 at the time. And so I just pursued my bodybuilding. But I did start to worry. I thought, I've put all this now, I've put all this effort into trying to build this body up and training hard and these things. Uh, and I've noticed when I look in the mirror that I didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I trained harder than anybody else. But I looked more like Bruce Lee. I was just, I just looked like a ripped chicken. <laughs> I was like, well, why don't I look massive? And uh, I remember speaking to a couple of lads in the gym and they were like, look, look, Warren, you are so in shape. We've never seen anyone with as much dedication and good genetics as you. But you know, until you take anabolic steroids, you're never gonna look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so I had to take that step. So you can imagine I'm now at a place living in a hostel, homeless, uh, and, then, and then looking at a course of anabolic steroids, you know, that I'm gonna to have to now sacrifice, potentially sacrifice my health to get my dreams. But they say in business, the bigger the risk, the bigger the payoff. I thought, well, I've come this far, there's no turning back. The safest way of taking anabolic steroids is by injecting them. And that's really grim, you know, because you think, well, I've taken a tablet, I can do that. But it has to bypass your liver, that's dangerous. People die of steroids, the safest way of taking them is through inject injecting. So all of a sudden now I'm homeless and injecting drugs. I'm like, man, I'm such a loser. I hope this pays off. But I've got to say, as soon as I started with the anabolic steroids, my body transformed like overnight. I grew up like, I grew up like, and I just started to grow and grow and grow. And I was like, why didn't I find these earlier? This is incredible. And uh, so in, I think within six months, I looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. My arms were 22 inches. My chest was 50 odd inches. I had a six pack. And people were like, whoa, you look incredible. And, uh, and um, you know, and it was then that I wrote into the TV show and said, yeah, I want to be a gladiator. And they're like, yeah, you're a gladiator, on you come. And so, um, and that's how I got the job. So the risk, the risk paid off, you know, all of, you know, a course of steroids and then bang, you're, you're celebrated. And then the next day after getting the job, they sent a stretch limousine Mercedes around to the YWCA, picked me up outside the back, drove me to Heathrow Airport, where I met all the gladiators who were superstars, they had bodyguards, you wouldn't believe it, which are great uh, gladiators, but they had bodyguards around them. And I couldn't believe, believe it, I was in awe. There was Jet, there was Wolf, and there was crowds of people around them. And all of a sudden I was hustled into this scrum of celebrities and I was 
in awe. And then they flew me first class to Mauritius to, uh, to the Gladiator training camp with all these beautiful women, sunshine, all this uh, Cocoa Beach it was called, you know, beautiful Indian Ocean where I just literally said, oh, this is your training camp, but there weren't a lot of training going on. <laughs> it was more partying really. So can you imagine? I used to lay there on the beach at night looking up at the stars saying, well, if there is a God, he must love me because life can't get much more blessed than this. When so many people telling you that you're ace and that you're brilliant, one girl stitched ace in the back of her hand. So we, we had these fans and, and at the time I thought, I mean, it's, it's poor girl, but now I think, I thought it was great. I was like, yeah, that's my girl. Yeah, I hope this catches on. <laughs> I mean, I was so twisted, so conceited. <laughs> And so, um, and yeah, so I, st I started to believe it. My whole identity now is wrapped up in, in my body. That's my armor. I'm bigger and better, faster and stronger. And I'm ace. This just, this just clarifies it. I'm the leader of the pack. I'm the top, I'm the top of Saturday night TV. Nobody taught me the paradox of pleasure, which means the more you get of something, the less it satisfies. I should have known it really, but all of a sudden when you've had all this money and all these experiences and all these fantasies coming true, life sort of loses its shine. And that shocked me a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, boring, boring. I had so many highs in life that, that normal life then just seemed like a low. It was boring, you know, I couldn't really appreciate anything anymore. Um, and like I say, you know, the most precious things in our life when you think about our relationships and our loved ones. And I noticed the money and the fame was separating me from that. And initially, because I was conceited, I thought, what are they jealous? Why are my brothers not coming with me? Why are my friends not coming with me? And I'd ask them and they'd say, oh, you've got so many hangers on, all these new friends, they're only your friends because they want to be friends with Ace on Gladiators. And acutely, I knew that, I was aware of it. But I was a bit like, well, well, okay, if you don't want to come along on this ride, then don't come on it. You know, I try and invite them, but your joy's not complete unless it's shared. And I couldn't share it with my loved ones. It's really confusing. You think, actually, I'm celebrated. For what, exactly? I'm not a hard worker. A lot of this business is nonsense. I'm selling something. I have a snidey agenda because I'm not open with it. I don't say I get all this stuff for free, otherwise they wouldn't give it to me. Newspapers would ring me up on a regular basis with my celebrity girlfriends and stuff, and they'd say to me, we want a sensational story. And they'd say, well, I haven't got one. They'd say, well, can you make one up? We'll pay you for it. And I'm like, really? Is it that easy? And so it was like there was a fool saying, look, we'll give you all this. What you got to do is just start telling lies. So we get up in the morning, me and my girlfriend, we make up a pack of lies. Should we get engaged this morning? Yeah, but I don't want to get engaged. Yeah, but they're going to pay us thousands. Yeah, let's get engaged. You're showing an ideal, but it's not the real. It's this made up persona. It's this identity that you want people to believe is true. And then other people are opening these magazines, escaping the monotony of their day, going, oh yeah, yeah, we, we want to be celebrities like this. Look how great their lives are. Look at their glamorous engagement. That's not even engagement. It's all nonsense. You're selling each other down the stream. So. It started off great, you know, all this money, all this fame and these things, but I started to see actually something was, was inherently wrong about all of this. So I think the interesting part of the story uh, is the fact that from the outside looking in, I had everything. The muscles, the fame, the success, the material wealth. But that was the ideal. The real was empty, I was hollow, and I was acutely aware I was spiritually empty. And you know, when you grow up and your mum and dad say to you, they're your authority in your life and you respect them and they say, there's no God. Your brother wouldn't have died if there was a God. That makes perfect sense. What sort of God would let a baby be born and then let it die in its cot? And then, and then you know, I watched my mum and dad's life melt down. I watched them go to the doctors and I watched them prescribe them antidepressants and you know and these things and, I, and, and so I, at that point I lose my parents at the weekend because they're in such grief they never deal with that grief really they're in arrested development they're so broken I'm like what God would let this happen but of course what I know now that I didn't know then is they didn't take this to God they took it to what the world says the answer is let's escape from our pain let's get some wine let's get some drinks let's party at the weekend let's take some antidepressants Let's get through the week and then just look forward to the weekend. It's like being on the Titanic, isn't it? We live for the weekend. It's a great big party, but you don't know you're going for an iceberg. with the sum of our choices. So when I'd seen all that, I was a bit like, well, okay, I'm spiritually empty, but I'm acutely aware there's, there's an emptiness in here and nothing out there, no amount of wealth, no amount of women, no amount of material possession can feel that. In fact, it makes the void even bigger. So I went on a real 
spiritual search. And like I say, when I spoke to friends, and especially friends with wisdom, older people that seem to be doing well in life as well, they'd just come up with like whimsical stuff like, oh yeah, I believe in karma. And I'm like, well, what's that? Yeah, what goes around comes around, you know what I mean? I'm like, no, I don't know what you mean. If there's something there or there isn't, so, oh yeah, yeah, well, you know, I believe my granddad's watching over me now, you know what I mean? And I'm like, no, I don't know what you mean. Or I'd go to a funeral and they'd say, oh, he's gone to a better place. And I'd say, has he? How do you know that? Oh, it's tragedy what happened. I say, is it? Why is it? He smoked 40 fags a day and drank eight pints on a regular basis. That ain't a tragedy, these are some of his choices. Why are we deluding each other with this sentimental nonsense? How do you know he's in a better, better place? There's no proof of that for him. This is a whimsical nonsense. Now, so let's all have a drink for him. I'm thinking we're all going to end up going the same way, aren't we? Surely, we're all killing ourselves with this escaping with the booze and the fags. And uh, so to me, a lot of this stuff seemed nonsense. No one gave any answers. At best, they, you know, they'd just have these little thoughts, but no one would really face it. So I started looking everywhere spiritually. But bear in mind, I would never look at the Bible. You know, I thought that was the world's best sales book. You know, this is something you read if you really sort of lost the plot, you know, crutch for cripples. I've been to enough churches to know they're not for me. And mum and dad always were like, be careful of Bible bashers. They'll brainwash you. Be careful of God squad. If there was a knock on the door, you know, they'd say, oh, I'd be behind the city. <laughs> We'd all get behind it and you'd be looking through the thing, you know, is it a Jehovah's Witness? Who is it? Just wait till they're gone. And I remember saying to a vicar, what, what do you do here? Where's God? Great building and all that. It's freezing. Can you put the heating on? Where's God in this? And that organ, especially on a Sunday morning, I like to have a drink on a, on a, on a, on a Saturday night. You can't have a banging a day anyway. And I'd start on that organ. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. I'd think, God, oh, anything but that, please. <laughs> so I struggled with these things. I remember that vicar saying to me, I said, so where's God in all this? And he, and he said, well, what do you mean, young man? I said, well, you know, what do you do here? He said, hatch, match, dispatch. So like, hatch, match, and dispatch. And he was like, yeah, so what's that? It's births, weddings, and funerals. I was like, oh, right, what, like a business? He was like, yes, I suppose so, exactly like a business. <laughs> I'm like, this is a crutch for cripples. You know, I was so cynical and hard-hearted from show business, it's great red carpets and glitz. Now all of a sudden I'm going in churches, you know, and, uh, and very cynical. So I was like, it's a speed camera. It says it's here for your safety, to protect you, to marry you, to, you know, for your birth, for your but really it's here to generate revenue. And they confirmed that and they're shaking a pot in front of me. Two minutes later, whoa, I'm like, yeah, righto, this is for mugs. So, so I was out of there quite quickly as well. So I went on this massive, massive spiritual journey and realized that every single avenue I went in was a dead end. But all of these, all of these spiritual teachings all mentioned Jesus, which I thought was strange. But they talked about Jesus and his great radical uh, uh, teachings of forgiveness and grace and love and turning the other cheek and loving your neighbor. But then they pointed to himself. So but yeah, Jesus said this, which was pretty good. But hey, now look at me. As far as I was concerned, you know, you cannot afford to take a risk on this stuff. You know, people say, oh, take a leap of faith. So I'm not going to take a leap of faith into something that might be completely nonsense. It's either true or it's false. I'm not a risk taker. I examine the evidence. And that's what I did over a couple of years. And uh, so it was, this, it was my next door neighbor that said to me, as we were really talking about spiritual things, he said, you should come to this house that I've been going to on a Friday. It's owned by a super rich man called Julian Richer. And, uh, and he has a fellowship on his garden, in his garden on a Friday. So I looked him up online and I heard that he had a private jet and two helicopters. I heard that people paying thousands of pounds for business advice and I thought, you can just go to his house for free and chat to him. And I know it might seem a bit of a sellout, but I thought, well, I just want to go and meet this fella and have a nose around his house. Do you know what I mean? And if he's making millions and millions, I want to know how he's doing it and see if he can chuck a bit of this fairy dust my way, a bit of this, uh, you know what I mean? And um, my next door neighbor said to me, he said, he said, it's, um, it's like a little fellowship they have in the garden. You, sh you should come along. And I was like, right, okay, I'll come along. And so I went on a Friday to Julian Richard's back, gar back garden. And, uh, and there was like a buffet on and it was all free. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the catch? What are they recruiting me for? Why would he want people in his garden? Eventually I meet uh, this Julian Richard and I was a bit shocked. He was really humble, really, really. You, you would never have known that he had this wealth. He was dressed really moderately and, and, uh, and he was serving as well, giving people drinks and food and serving me, giving me plates. And I was like, 
I, I haven't met anyone like this before. And then it became apparent that, uh, that he's a Christian. And I thought, a Christian? I thought Christians had to give all their money away. This is interesting. I thought, if you're following God, you had to be poor, didn't you? If you're following, Jesus turned up on a donkey, didn't he? Didn't turn up in a private jet. I'm a bit like, this geezer's following Jesus. This don't make any sense to me. And then I got chatting to him over the next few weeks and I remember him saying to me, I remember him saying to him, look, you know, I'm not, I've realised you can't be content with content. You know, the world says you can. If you get all the stuff you want and you get, you know, and you get this, all the things that you thought would make you happy, you'll be content. But you're not, it does the opposite. You can't be content with content. So how comes you ain't lost your mind or, got, or gone bad on drugs or womanising, these sorts of things? I was asking him these very direct questions. And uh, he was like, I'm going to give you some advice. Do you respect me as a businessman? And I was like, well, of course, of course I do. I've never met anyone as successful in business as you. And he said, um, well, I'm going to prescribe you two things. Will you listen to me? And I was like, well, it's free advice from the, world, from the country's top businessman. Of course I'll listen. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'll listen. He says, OK, I want you to go on an alpha course. And I thought, an alpha course, what's that? And I thought, oh, I've been on so many courses, all these religions and that. I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to go mad. How much is this going to cost me? You know, he said, and then um, he said, and then, and this bit floored me. He said, get baptized and come back to me. And I thought, get baptized? Oh no, he's a Bible basher. He's in the God squad and he's trying to, why would he? Why would he want any money off me? The dough he's got. Didn't make any sense to me. And I, I looked at him sort of sidewards and I remember going back to my missus and saying to her, so my, my missus always identified as a Christian. And, and as far as I was concerned, I saw no evidence of her knowing God, my wife. So I was a bit like, well, it's just a tagline. You know, yeah, C of E, I'm a Christian. Yeah, 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 whatever. I'm born into this rite of passage, you know. And so I went back and she went, well, what was it like at Julian's house? And I was like, oh, he's, well, I see he's one of your mob. He's a Bible basher. She was like, what? So he's told me to go on an alpha course. She went, she went, what's that? So we looked it up and it was a Christian course. And I was like, see, look, a religious course. She, she was like, no, no, we, 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 should, we should go on that. Anyway, there's a guy at this uh, fellowship at Julian's house called Alan Ashworth. And Alan said, yeah, and he pushed a little bit. He's like, you should come on this course. So me and my missus went on this alpha course, a six week course run by the uh, St. Michael of Belfry in York, right near the York Minster. And, um, and it was the first place I think I'd ever been in a sensible environment where actually you could ask the bigger questions in life. And uh, so straight away, I pretty much went there to prove them wrong. I thought, you know, this delusional bunch that are just, you know, suckering people in, believing that there's this, they're going to buy their place in space. If they put a few quid in their bucket, I'll, I'll, I'll shine a bit of light into this and show them it's a load of nonsense that you can't really trust anyone. It's a dog eat dog out world out there. This is a crutch for cripples. And I really believed that that's what was going to happen on that, on that alpha course. And I also thought it was going to shine my, my uh, light on my wife's false piety, you know, she said, oh yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I'm, I'm a very good person, yes, my mum and dad are Christian, yes, we're very, very good. <laughs> I was a bit like, yeah, but, but, but a Christian, it means like you're serving God, but we're really serving ourselves and our kids, you know what I mean, it's conditional. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it was on that course, actually, where I, was, where I first heard the gospel. And actually, what a tragedy, a tragedy that that is. You know, everybody knows the name Jesus Christ. He turned up 2,020 years ago. He was in ministry for just three years. And he announces the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, which just means turn away from all the worldly nonsense you're following. Come back to me, because I'm love, I'm, un I'm unconditional love. And, uh, and it's got to be invited in to be love. So you've got to invite me and I'll forgive all your sins. You'll live, forget forever. You'll have abundant life now. And actually you'll move into your divine purpose. Not, not, not your career, your calling. Why is that then? Because you'll never die. When God created you, he didn't want you to die. We, we, we go our own way. That's what sin is. We come away from God's, what God had planned for us. But actually that's not his plan. He wants you to go into eternity with him. A bit like you're on a trap door, Warren. It's your choice, really. At some point that trap door is going to open. We all die, don't we? So it's your choice, fall into an abyss, you don't know where, separated from God, or into God's loving hands. Your choice. It's like, right, right, um, right, okay, but am I, am I good enough for this sort of stuff? I mean, I've done some stuff that ain't that great. Um, well, you don't worry about that as well. You forgive all your sins, past, present, and future. What, you'll just, you'll just wipe them clean? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what he does. That's why Jesus come. Because no one's, everyone falls short of the glory of God. We all end up serving ourselves, the heart of the problem. It's a problem of the human heart. We end up selfish. If you respond to it, then it'll be good news. But it's like, it's a free gift from God. He's given it to you, but you've got to unwrap it, Warren. 
you don't unwrap something, giving you a bar of soap, you don't wash with it, it's gonna have no effect on you, is it? And I was like, right. And what's it gonna cost me? Nothing, he says, nothing at the point of receiving it. And as he's, as he's saying this, I'm expecting the whole group to erupt in laughter because it's so ridiculous. I'm like, wrap your head around this. They're telling us you're gonna have all this. It's not about you, it's not about your career. God has a, a calling on your life, you know? And I just think, surely no one's believing this, are they? I had no idea there was evidence. I had no idea the Bible's a book that's over 5,000 years old, going back through all history, not just knowledge, but wisdom, uh, uh, prophecies that have all been fulfilled, all this stuff that I couldn't disprove. The Codex Sinaiticus, the, you know, we live in such a blessed nation. The, the British Library's got the first Bible ever written, nearly 2,000 years old, and what's written in there is exactly what's written in our Bible today. These things haven't been changed. And I'm like, John's Gospel's there as well. And I'm like, I had no idea there was all this evidence. And then of course, I started tying it in. I started seeing that Jesus turned up in the middle of gladiator times, which was massively significant to me because I've been on some show that I thought was the be all and end all, but we're talking about real gladiator games. So the, incredi the incredible thing about Jesus for me is the fact that he willingly died to death on that cross so that we don't have to. So we look at life and we say, oh, it's a tragedy and we turn away, like I say, society hides death. We turn away, we don't want to know about it. But actually, because of the work Jesus did on the cross, we don't have to die. He's done that. He's taken our place. So through Jesus Christ, we can be atoned to God, at one with God, without actually having to die or having to fear death. You know, the body may pass away, but I know that I'm going to have eternity with God. And so when the curate's saying to me, yes, but... You might have examined the evidence, you know, and this was going on over weeks. You might think, but can you conceive that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah, I can conceive it in my mind, yeah, but can that fall into your heart, Warren? Can you believe in your heart of hearts? That's who he is. You know, you've been worshipping yourself, you've been worshipping being a macho man, what the world says is a man now. Can you really submit to Jesus Christ? Can you say, I'll give my life to Jesus Christ and I will follow you? It was really, really tough for me, and I was like, oh, what? How do I do it? It's very simple. You say a prayer and God will do what he said he'll do. He said, can I suggest, Ron, the biggest block between you and God is you. It's you. That's why you don't know him. And you might say your prayers on the jaw, please God let me win so I don't get the sack. But there's a reason he ain't answering them because you don't know him, you're separated from him. I said, Ben, why has no one ever told me this? God's created you. I just thought, well, if I do more good than bad, Surely, when it, if there is a judgment, I'll take my chances. But if there is, he'll say, yeah, yeah, you've done a bit better. But actually, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to earn it. He said, no, no, I don't worry about that. I've already earned it for you. There's no earning to do. You can come straight into my family. I love you that much. It's an unconditional, it's an unconditional gift. But then he said, and this is the clencher. So what are you going to do about it? And I was like, what, what have I got to do about it? He said, you know what you could do about it, Warren. You have to submit to Jesus. You have to say, a very simple prayer. You have to say sorry for your sins. If you can do that, if you can humble yourself around, say sorry for going your own way. If you can say thank you to God for doing what he did by sending his son and sacrificing him for you. And if you can then say, well, come into my life, make me the person you want me to be. Within the next two weeks, actually, um, that my wife saw such a change in me that she said, this prayer that you said, I need to say it. And, um, and, and she realized that she was no more a Christian than me standing in a, in, a, in a garage makes me a mechanic because she hadn't actually consciously invited God into her life and submitted to Jesus Christ. You know, you want to find God, you follow Jesus. And, but she wasn't following Jesus. And so that was a real pivotal moment. And so, um, uh, it was incredible actually because and, and it's funny how the Holy Spirit manifested and like I say I expected to be like Bruce Almighty you know high or silver and all the cars move out my way because I had none of these supernatural powers as such for my own use but I did start to notice things change massively straight away straight away and I think one of the one of the biggest things for me is I felt the truth literally started to set me free I felt a real liberation a real striving seemed to cease almost straight away all the things I had my identity in before suddenly didn't matter anymore. I suddenly started experiencing joy that I hadn't before. My, my, I'd had happiness, temporal happiness, but not joy. What I love about Jesus is that, um, unlike religion, 
that says, earn it, earn your way to heaven or, or learn it. Um, Jesus says, actually, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is light, and I come that you may have life and have it in its abundance. And he's already done it. It's all done for you. It's like, and relax. Instead of all these self-help books, oh, you can do it, do this, do that. It's actually saying, no, no, you don't have to do anything. You're living in the golden age of God. All you have to do is repent and believe. What amazes me is I'm not interested in celebrity culture. I know that it has a hidden agenda, it's a business there, it's a commercial business. Uh, and I'm not motivated by business or by money. I'm striving for me as, as seized. And yet, God keeps giving me opportunity after opportunity um, uh, uh, in, a, in a celebrity culture to go on TV shows and talk about the gospel. It constantly, constantly amazes me. You know, you go on to a TV show and they have an agenda. You know, they wanna, they wanna get their story across. You know, look how you went from rags to riches or riches to rags or whatever else. And, or they want to go over the nostalgia, nostalgia about gladiators and the place in people's hearts or, or put you on telly and say, look, he used to be young, fit, good looking, big muscles. Look at the state of him now. He's let himself go. They've got all these agendas. Um, but actually, I just go on and I talk about the gospel. And it's incredible because initially you see a lot of people like gospel, Jesus. Oh, oh, we don't want to. Well, we can't go down this down this area. But incredibly, um, I'm getting lots and lots of opportunities to do that. And I'll carry on doing that because I know that this is a divine privilege actually, and I know that it transforms lives. Tell, tell people about who Jesus Christ is. It's not just a Christmas story, it's not a sentimental story. You know, this is good news, but actually we have to respond to it. It's a gift from God. So when I was on the Gladiators, the, the strap line of the show was the ultimate challenge. The ultimate challenge, but actually it wasn't an ultimate challenge. In fact, the show's history, isn't it? It's done, the goose is cooked. Uh, my challenge is consistently to examine the evidence. There can be nothing better than you can be doing than examining the evidence of the person of Jesus Christ. Are you fit for eternity? People, well, what's eternity? You know, and then it's like, well, you've got to think about your soul. It goes on forever. You know, your spirit it will carry on, and so you've got to decide: Are you fit for eternity?